So hey, first of all, for people that don't know you, um, why don't you just quickly explain to them what you did with Digital Vertico and how that... It's for uh, X Potomac. Yeah, I might broadcast that if it's all right. But if not, I could just. That's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I'm a writer. I'm a broadcaster, entrepreneur. I founded a company, uh, Audio Cafe, in the mid '90s. I have a weekly show on TechCrunch, interview, video show. I do columns for a lot of people, including CNN. Uh, written two books, Cult the Amateur, which was critical of. Uh, Web 2.0 and the democratization of the internet. I just came out with a new book this year, Digital Vertigo, which is critical of the soul, what I call the cult of the social, our obsession with technology's obsession with transparency and openness. Right. So, uh, you know, I, some people see me as a technology reactionary. I'm not really. I mean, I'm as wired as anyone. Uh, I have as many devices, well, maybe not quite as many devices as. as as everybody, but I'm online all the time, mobile, uh, you know, so, uh, but I am uh, more skeptical of some of the um, social and cultural consequences, particularly the way in which the web is disintermediate, continues to disintermediate both the experts and um, the creative class, you know, writers, musicians, uh, filmmakers, I don't think generally for the most part it's benefited creative people. It's been great for entrepreneurs, great for programmers, technologists, investors, VCs, but not so great for the creative industry. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in your mind, when you consider digital vertigo, how does big data fit into that picture and what are some of the challenges that we're facing with it? Um, well, the big data is, of course, the current buzzword when it comes to describing the world we're living in. I fear, and this is what's development and the argument in digital vertigo, is that on the web, we've all essentially become data. There's an excellent writer called, um, he wrote a book called The Information, um, uh, James Gleek, and he writes, we've become information, we've become data in the digital age. Um, and I think he's right, I think we are distributing ourselves on the network. Uh, and I'm fearful of the impact it has, both on, in, obviously in terms of our privacy, in terms of our identity, in terms of our relationship with each other. I fear that the more we reveal about ourselves, the lonelier we become, the more we actually destroy the social. So um, my book sort of argues that, we're, that the web has become a, uh, another version of Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon. Uh, yeah architecture in which everything is always visible, we're always on, we're always being watched. And I argue that that darkness, that solitude is essential for us, both in terms of maintaining who we are as a species, as, as individuals, but also in terms of our innovation and creativity. I think one of the great illusions in Silicon Valley is the idea that collaboration benefits innovation. I don't think that's generally true. I did a speech uh, at TEDx in Brussels earlier this month. Um, and it was TEDx is tough, man. I just did one myself. Practicing for that is that's the hardest speaking gig I've ever done. Yeah, well, um, and this TEDx was actually the biggest one. I think it's two thousand or twenty five hundred people in the audience. The reason they were all there wasn't to listen to me, but to listen to uh, Steve Wozniak. Ah. And I noted, and Steve was kind of impressed with this. I think he said he was moved by my speech. But I made the point, it wasn't really my point, it was taken from Susan Cain's new book, Quiet, that it's introverts, it's people who separate themselves from the crowd who are the most innovative. Yes. Susan, in her new book, actually dedicates a whole chapter to Wozniak. So I think as we begin to live more and more online, as the internet becomes the platform for 21st century life, we've got to figure out dark spaces. We've got to figure out places that individuals can actually escape rather than be continually observed, continually obliged to be on Yammer or Facebook or these other networks. So uh, I'm not arguing against technology. I argue against the way in which technology has become an instrument, almost a weapon of the, the people who are so committed, for one reason or other, often ideological, but often 
purely for money, financial reasons, right. to uh, the, this idea of radical transparency. I mean, obviously, someone like Zuckerberg... Vested interest. You know, anytime anyone posts data on his network, he benefits financially. But there are also people intellectually, people like Clay Shirky, who I respect both personally and intellectually, who seem to think that this visibility is a good thing, that it will benefit society. I'm not so sure. Isn't that an ideal, though, that we're hearing? I mean, it's an idealism, but when we get into it, we often find that there are many great complications and consequences. Yeah, well, there, and there are often those consequences are unintended. Often this technology is being created for the best of reasons. I mean, it's obvious in, in terms of, say, the Arab Spring, that in some ways the technology has been beneficial. It generated uh, a platform to help the resistance against autocrats, against injustice. But it's also been used by the regimes themselves to persecute. It's a platform that's being used to peddle stereotypes about people, racism, hatred against different religious groups. So, uh, yeah, often the, the technology, the, the, it's the unintended consequences of technology, which in my mind are often the most interesting, but also the most problematic. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Now, for a lot of people talk about the consequences that affect the individual. Are there consequences that are affecting businesses that start getting involved in harnessing this data and the impact it makes on them and with their customers? Well, absolutely. I think the businesses are kind of like the kid in the candy store um, when they can have the opportunity to eat and gorge themselves. But we know the kid in the candy store who overeats turns out to lose their teeth or become obese or have a heart attack. Um, and I think businesses have to be a little careful on lots of levels. Firstly, as I said, I think they need to be very careful about encouraging or certainly forcing their employees to reveal too much about themselves. I think it I, I think it's very dangerous. I think it undermines innovation and creativity. I think the smartest people are the people who are able to escape from public opinion. Yeah. Escape from the crowd or the group. So I would discourage businesses from certainly forcing and even encouraging their employees to be on these networks and to you know, introduce networks like Yammer to the workplace, where after a while everyone's on it. And of course, it's the noisiest ones who are often the least creative, the least productive. They spend their whole time blowing smoke, which doesn't benefit anyone. I think businesses also need to be careful about acquiring the data of their customers. I think there is currently a kind of a backlash, but that backlash will grow more and more as whether it's a backlash against government or healthcare providers or newspapers or media groups, as individuals understand that they're being tracked, they're being stalked by businesses. So I think it's very important in this age of radical transparency for businesses themselves to be radically transparent, that to be clear about what they are and aren't doing with their data, because if they're not clear, ultimately they'll be exposed and humiliated. It's good for the, what's good for, it's good for, Excuse me, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, correct? Exactly. And um, we're already seeing that on lots of levels. And in this sort of hyper-democracy where data travels so fast in a, in, a, in a trending culture where, you know, in the space of a few seconds, a company can literally be destroyed. It's re in a reputation economy where reputations can be destroyed, sometimes by lies, by false tweets or false posts. Companies need to be very, very careful about what they aren't and aren't doing. They never can control social media. Every company is vulnerable to that, so that the locusts, the way in which uh, reputations can be destroyed in a few seconds or potentially destroyed, but they need to have protection. They need to build kind of fortresses where, in the worst case scenario, at least they can say to their customers, look, we told you that this is how we use your, your data, and this is true. If they, if they have terms of service which are unclear, long, legalistic, then they're much more vulnerable. Of course, they're particularly vulnerable if they lie. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> what do you think about the current over-focus on influence, or do you think it's an over-focus at all? Excuse me, I probably led you a little bit with that question. Um, let me rephrase it. What do you think of the current focus on influencers? Uh, do you think it's actually representative of customers 
And do you think it will impact this big data future that we're discussing right now? Yeah, I don't think it's exaggerated. I'm critical of the culture because I think what's happened is that everyone... I just did an interview today for my show with Ray Kurzweil on TechCrunch TV. And like so many of the digital utopians, I mean, he's perhaps the most intelligent and influential, um, he talks about the way in which the Internet is democratizing culture, democratizing business. But actually, the reverse is true. Because what we're seeing is the rise of new influences. In my book, I write about Robert Scoble, who epitomizes this new class of, of, of influences. It's a very sort of Darwinian world where there's a tiny handful of people on Twitter and on Facebook and on Clout and all these other networks with huge amount of influence, and then everybody else. So we have a new kind of aristocracy in our reputation economy. Now, for businesses, that's not necessarily a bad thing because they need to get to those influences. But, of course, those influences themselves are also vulnerable to the crowd. Right. Because the crowd makes these influences so it can destroy them. Uh, but it's no coincidence that the most, you're, you're seeing the way in which... I mean, take somebody like Tim Ferriss and the way in which he single-handedly seems to be sort of reinventing or destroying or rebuilding the publishing industry. He could have never done this without the web. That's true. Global's another example. Uh, so these people are very, very real. Businesses have to understand that. I'm not saying it's good. I mean, I'm a skeptic. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that actually the truth about digital media is that it's less democratic. Uh, that actually we have tinier and tinier elites. That Pareto's laws, I write about this in my book, Pareto's laws work much more perfectly, or to, 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 to use a pun, in, in this yeah, very big the long tail. As we have no no external influences on the market, it's a very pure reputational economy, and you have a tiny group of of influences. You know whether it's the lady, the traditional media superstars, the Lady Gagas of the world, or these new media superstars, the, the Scobles and Ferrises of the world. So businesses need to understand this. They need to work with the influences. They need to understand, for example, that. And the New York Times probably has less and less value, but a Maureen Dowd, a, a Thomas Friedman, they have more and more value. Right. So in media, it's not the brands anymore that have value, it's the individuals. So we have a new age of kind of individual brands, uh, and as these brands begin to recognize their power, the entire media and business landscape changes. I, again, Ferris is a very good example of this because... He's one of the smartest. He understands the way the world is working, and of course, he's reshaping the world too. Now, this actually is a good segue. I'd, I'd like to bring up Cold of the Amateur a little bit. And uh, obviously, I read the book. At first, I was horrified by the book, probably because it described me to some extent. But as time has progressed, um, as time has progressed, though, it's become clear that we do have a big issue that has arisen as a result of social media. And that is the destruction of quality of information and the inability for people, it seems, to delineate fact from fiction and opinion from perhaps truth, although truth is a very subjective word. Can you describe where we are today with the quality of information and our society and its ability to understand information? Well, we have more and more data. You know, it's big data. We have more and more data, more and more stuff being thrown at us. You know, Twitter, I'm... As we're talking, I'm getting all these beeps in the background from retweets of something I wrote on TechCrunch on my Twitter, uh, on my Twitter uh, uh, address. But um, I'm not going to have time to read any of that. I don't have any time to read anything except stuff about myself. So I'm, you know, I'm not saying that this technology and media lends itself to our narcissism, but it certainly fuels it in some way. So Absolutely, I'm looking at mine too. <laughs> we're all in the, you know, we're all in the same narcissism business as each other. Yeah, so I mean, what I was saying on Cult of the Amateur, which isn't that outrageous, but was treated as if I was saying, you know, God doesn't exist, or oh, Jews yeah, have two exist. heads, or women should be, you know, circumcised or something. Uh, all, I, all I made the point is that um, uh, the, the, the content information is better when it has mediators, that editors... Uh, agents improve the quality of work. It's better to have filters, human filters. 
And as we had the appearance on Web 2.0 of all these, you know, networks, user-generated content who disintermediated traditional media, whether it was the way in which, you know, Google gets rid of the librarian or YouTube gets rid of Hollywood or the blogosphere gets rid of newspaper editors. I said that was a bad thing. First, it lends itself to corruption because it's easier and easier to print lies. And I'm not saying that tr traditional media always printed the truth, but it did a better job because it was relatively fair, at least in the West. Secondly, um, it lends itself to this kind of explosion of, inf of, of, of opinion without, with fewer and fewer facts. As, as we have the crisis of newspapers, as fewer and fewer people are willing to pay for stuff, and as everyone has their own opinion on the world, everyone has less and less knowledge of the world. Now, this is also bound up, I think, in broader cultural problems. You know, the American television, I think, news, tele news networks are a catastrophe. I loathe MSNBC equally as, as Fox because neither of them actually report the news. Yeah. Uh, but there's less and less interest in reporting the news. You know, CNN gets trashed for being boring. Uh, and you know, maybe it is, but at least it does a better job than either Fox or MSNBC to actually tell the world what's really going on. Um, so as we have, again, this disintermediation, as content loses its value, as everyone idealizes the notion of free content or publicly owned content, we have a crisis of the professional creative class, from journalists to musicians to filmmakers to librarians to writers uh, and um, less and less real information more and more data we have the appearance of what uh, you know the the, the the filter bubble the echo chamber culture uh, which a lot of people have written about so overall I think whilst the internet is vibrant and energetic and engaging in some ways and I use it as much as anyone it hasn't done a very good job enabling busy people to actually learn about the world in a reliable way. The New York Times is still beats the internet in the sense that you have a group of professional people who decide every morning what gets on the front of the paper, four or five important stories, and that's what gets read. I think that that is way more valuable in civic terms than Reddit. Which is, you know, <laughs> me, it's the cultural and... Is a, is a cultural and moral catastrophe. There you go. Well, this is perfect, Andrew. Do you have anything more? Let me uh, let me give you an open-ended question. Do you have anything more you would add to our uh, DC friends here before uh, we close no, I'm out? I'm not going to give anything more because I don't like giving my content away for free. And <laughs> if, if you want, if you want the real real stuff, you've got to come in February. I'm looking forward to meeting you all uh, in DC, my uh, my least favorite city, but uh, in in February, I guess it will be bearable because the weather won't be too hot. Well, it's uh, 70 degrees today in December, so I think uh, we can discuss the climate change myth, too, when you're here as well. Where's the event? It's uh, February 25th, and it's going to be at the Source Theater. It should be outstanding. Oh, lovely. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, thank you for the interview, and I hope everyone gets to read, uh, particularly Digital Vertigo, because they'll, before the event, because that will help them understand what my, where I'm coming from. Yeah, it'll be outstanding. We really appreciate it, Andrew. Thank you. Okay, bye. Cheers. Is that good? Is that enough? That's perfect. You did a great job.